Hello, I am so happy to be here speaking to you guys. I'm Shira Leibowitz. And I'm Corey Berg. And we are so happy to speak a little bit about early childhood education today, uh, stemming from a conversation that Corey, you and I have been having for months, I would say actually years. Years, I was gonna correct you, it's now years. been years. It's been years, it's been years. And, and I am so grateful for the friendship we've developed. So you and I met really out of a shared um, desire to tell the story of early childhood education through pandemic from those very early frightening days. And we both did it with a lot of commitment and a lot of dedication in different ways. So you, Corey, uh, went live on social media frequently and spoke beautifully, magnificently from your heart. And that's how we met. That's how you met a lot of early childhood educators throughout those early days and, and up until today, um, speaking our truth and speaking our experience so beautifully. And I am a much more writer than speaker. So I set out to document what was happening in a book that's titled Havens of Hope, Ideas for Redesigning Education from the COVID-19 pandemic that will be released late spring or early summer. And you, my darling, are featured in the book and are as articulate as always in that. And <laughs> Sometimes are, a little too much comes out of this mouth. <laughs> we love this mouth and we're gonna hear more. So actually that's what led us to this conversation because you were just featured in this amazing NBR article that resonated so broadly and really went viral because it resonated so broadly. And so when I read that article and it's linked below as is um, an opportunity to pre-purchase my book for anybody interested, uh, definitely read Corey's article. Um, it's powerful. And I read the article and I had two emotions, which are the two emotions I've had, I think, through the whole pandemic. One was such um, connection to what you were saying and such gratitude to you for saying it. And the article speaks truth. And then the other piece of me felt um, this kind of disappointment or, or lack, I guess, of filling in another part of the story, which is equally true, which is about the resilience and the quality and the excellence that has been in the field of early childhood education, always really and specifically throughout the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, well, let's just say it's really weird <laughs> to see your face everywhere telling a painful story. And that article did tell a painful story. And I, I kind of had the same reaction, even just seeing the pictures that were taken of me and seeing how tired I've gotten over this whole period. Um, and I agree that it, it was, there was more to it. I was worried that people would only see me as, oh gosh, the director has deal, had, had to deal with a lot of angry people. Um, and one thing that I just like so much about your book is that it really, I think when I read every story, including my own, I got to discover my own story. You know, we have these ideas, like I talk about, there was a time I felt like a villain you know, being in this pandemic, telling what we were doing behind the scenes and people weren't quite getting it yet. Um, and other times we're put on this pedestal, like we're some kind of hero and the story felt like kind of like we're victims, but really we're just vulnerable people day to day trying to survive like we always are. And this book has a really great way of sharing that story so much, Corey. And it was so awesome to connect with you around the book and, and so many conversations we've had. And one quote that I have from you in the book, there's a lot of powerful quotes for me in the book. This may be the most powerful. And, and I just want to share it back with you because it got me through some of the darkest days. Um, this is what you said. Do you remember? If they took everything from us and just gave us an empty room with no windows, we would have found a way. We would have told stories, sung songs, and run around. And Corey, every single time, it just got harder and harder and harder. I thought about that. All we need is the love and connection between the adults and the kids, and we can make anything work. And that that time and time again, I thought that. And, and what that also led me to was this 
um, realization of how much constraint can lead to creativity and how much we have within us that we brought out that we didn't know about, we didn't know was within us before. And I, I had this feeling throughout of being almost like, like a sculptor of my own program, just sculpting us down to our very essence, finding what at the core was most important and just bringing that out as big as we could and not worrying about the rest. Yeah, I just, I love that image because, you know, I'm a trained artist. I actually was working on a degree in art when I became a, a, an artist in residence at a Reggio school. And that kind of changed the course of my life. But the, when I think about um, sculpting in particular, you think of a big block of clay and you're extracting to get down. You're, you're really looking at the negative space, creating negative space and positive space. And that that is part of what we did. And, you know, that quote, I remember reading, um, what is it, like one of the first drafts of the book. When I read that, I was like, did I really say that? But that really is true. We had such a fighting mentality. I mean, and that was back when, you know, sometimes we saw some pretty extreme things like tape taped out on the floor, keeping children away from each other. And it, and some people got really angry about that, but it was really just educators trying to figure this out. None of that stuck. It was just, just trying to figure it out. Um, so that metaphor of sculpting and sometimes you put things back in, you take out and put back in. But also, you know, I use art metaphors a lot, just being an artist. When I think about working on a program or creating some kind of protocol the other part about making art is you go in and you make sure it looks good up close but you also got to stand back and see the whole big picture and that's what we also were trying to do how can we make it safe for the kids safe for the whole community um, and does it still look good for the child up close in their experience so yeah, I, you know, when you talk about the up close and standing back, it reminds me of what for me was really the defining moment for me of the pandemic and, and as an educator. So it was, you know, you remember, Corey, the intensity of those early days of the pandemic and how yeah. scared we were and how really <sighs> um, like we were one of the only ones going out of our homes, right? And we're going to work every day. Right. And um, so this was a moment, it, it was early April, and um, you and I had the same experience of applying for the Paycheck Protection Plan loans that were given to small businesses uh -huh. and right, <laughs> getting locked out the first time around right. and thinking we were just going to go under. So I, I own my center, and, and I had not wanted to furlough any of my faculty. I, I, I thought that I could get through without doing it. I, I couldn't. I did briefly and brought them back. But when I didn't get the Paycheck Protection Plan loan the first time around, I, I knew that wasn't sustainable, at least short term. I had been paying. There was no income coming in. We went down to six kids from having had close to 90. Um, and I was, wow. I was paying out of my my own savings and, and thought that oh. I, I could do that for a little while. And so this was, you know, one of the first days after I, I didn't get the loan, got it later, but, and had to furlough most of my faculty. And so it was me, it was one administrator. Uh, another one of our administrators was out sick, suspected COVID. Uh, but at the time you couldn't even get a COVID test. So, you know, if you had a low grade fever or any kind of symptom, they just said, stay home for 14 days and go to the hospital if you can't breathe. So she was home. Um, and one teacher that we kept on and we're in this one room and the rest of the center is dark and silent and it was so eerie. And we're in this one room and I step back, like you say, stepping back and watching. And what I observed was bar none, the most beautiful moment of child-centered play mm -hmm. and I had ever seen in my career. So what was going on? The kids had taken, I had brought cardboard boxes. And initially we had built a farm out of the cardboard boxes because they were into animals. And then they, we were washing our hands all the time, at least every 30 minutes, if not more, it was just constant washing hands. And that of everything going on was what fascinating these kids the most. So we tried to make it a game and fun and playful. And so they got really into water. So they built a car wash, wash your hands, we wash our cars, wash everything. So they built this cardboard box, this elaborate 
um, car wash. They're washing the cars and they hooked up a, a little hose and they're washing the cars. And then the, the younger ones took these bins of water and soap and they're washing the animals from the farm because you have to clean the animals to keep them safe and clean too. And then <laughs> they took the road from, the, it was a road bringing supplies to the farm and they took it. And once the cars were clean from the car wash, they drove down this road and the road was the highway to happiness. Four-year-olds made this up. And you drove <laughs> down the highway to happiness and you could be anywhere in the world, real, imagine you could be anywhere you want. So we're going down vacations on the highway to happiness. And this was what I observed. And this was the most impactful learning I can remember. And that water exploration went on for about five months. We explored the clouds. We created a cloud observatory. We built an aquarium. We planted it into the garden. There was <laughs> so much, of course. Um, and so we looked back and said, you know, the, the adult world is terrified of COVID and wants to talk about COVID protection and the kids are saying water is awesome. Um, so <laughs> we, that was a moment that has shaped me. And, and I felt that I was standing at this founding moment for education. And in the midst of this terror and devastation, we were already seeing the beginning of creating something new. Hmm. That's touching. I, I think for me, a really defining moment was when I was starting, like I had already been working on pandemic protocols and trying to work on this. This was before states were even coming out with things. And I had just done a lot of research and, and that. And I was starting to uh, do little, you know, video chats with directors really from all over the world on what you can do. And there we were thinking about things like, well, should you as the director be holding kids up to your face? If, if you're not necessarily needed for their actual care and um, saying that to a director and she's like, oh, no, I can't. Of course, I have to. This is why I do it. And I mean, of course, we've been told for years we don't get the best pay. We do it for the hugs. What does it mean that if you're not going to get the hugs anymore? And it made me think, like, as I talk to people, what are you actually willing to do if it meant saving somebody's life? And what I realized was there's a lot I can do. There is a lot that I personally am willing to do. And I would say I tended to be on the more extreme side. I just had a real sense that I, you know, I don't have a family at home. And so it's really just me with my own responsibility with my life thinking through. I really didn't go anywhere for over a year and a half other than the center and my home back and forth. I just didn't want to get any contact um, till till the vaccine and even after I got vaccinated. So I knew I could really go for far. But then I had another defining moment and that was about, you know, maybe it was a few months after this, about a year and a half in. And that was when I realized oh, this isn't healthy anymore. Everybody else is already like visiting family and all of that. And it's time for me to let this go for myself. So it was, a, it was time to think about myself and my own care. And that has been the second journey of this whole pandemic, which is what I've been talking about more recently. So yeah, defining moments for sure. We've, it's made us really think about what's important to us. Yeah, it's been beautiful to see that transformation in you. And, and from the earliest conversations we had, I, there was that questioning of how do I take care of myself? What's wellness? What's core? And, right. and yes, I see how that's developed and it's beautiful and such a beautiful modeling for the field on how we need to take care of ourselves to continue to do this work. Um, it makes me think about, you know, in, in everything that we've done in all the change that we've gone through and continue to go through and all the adversity we've faced and continue to face uh, in all we've pulled back on what at its core can't we compromise on and mm -hmm. I've thought about that a lot through the pandemic. And for me, I, I've always, or for a long time, um, grounded myself in experiential learning. And experience still matters to me, but what became even more important was environment and the environment we create. And mm -hmm. having a feeling of an environment where people are safe physically and emotionally. And that was for kids 
and it's also for faculty. And it led to, you know, what we can compromise on, can not compromise on not doing what keeps kids and teachers socially, emotionally safe. And that's been a redesign of our time and our priorities and a real cultural focus on um, no tolerance for teachers not having each other's backs. If we're struggling with other parts of the work or the education, that's okay. But we've really worked on a culture of caring for each other. And, and that's been core. And it's what I came to call um, the title of the book, A Haven of Hope. You know, where can, can and, and there, were, there were really three components to that for me, creating that environment, that haven of hope in a world that needs so much healing on the micro level and the macro level in these kids' lives and families' lives and teachers' lives and in the world. Um, there were three things that were really concrete. The first was to keep calm. Whatever was going on, um, we could handle it without drama, without getting frazzled. So we really dive deep into this core of calm that now permeates the center in a way that I'm really proud of. Um, the other was facing the truth and telling the truth. So, and some of the truths are hard and not what people want to hear. And so to have this very calm comes into this, but we're not going to ignore the truths that we have to face and we're not going to sugarcoat them and we're going to tell them um, calmly, compassionately, kindly, respectfully, but we're going to tell our truth. And that has helped um, in the relationship between parents and, and us and my staff in a way that's really healthy. So from the very beginning, we didn't have our first known COVID case. I had, you know, a few suspected cases of staff early on before you had to shut centers before any, I mean, in the earliest days before anyone knew what to do with any of this, but we didn't have a case calling for a quarantine until January of 2021. So we went a long time mm -hmm. and, um, there were lots of centers who were very proud of not having a case, and, and I wasn't. Um, and everybody knew to expect when parents were coming in or touring or asking uh, about the program, have you had a COVID case? We never bragged about it. So our answer was always not yet, but we could within the next 10 minutes. And, and mm -hmm. for me, it was always um, not if, when, and people should be prepared that when it happens, it's not the person's fault who got COVID. Nobody is at fault for getting COVID. It's a contagious virus pandemic that people get simply because they get it. And so, um, and if we have to shut down, we have to shut down because we do what's required. And so that happened for us. There was clearly some upset and what, what other directors and programs have felt, but much less because we laid the groundwork of, we speak the truth, we face the truth and we do what we have to do with the truth. So that was really core. Um, and then the last piece was play. When all else fails, play. And that's, I thought of your quote over and over and over again. If you don't know what to do, if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling anxious, just dance with the kids, play with the kids. Don't worry about the lesson plans. All of that will come. All of it will merge. But if we can get to a place where we can be really playful then we're there, our presence is there and we're creating that environment that has been so core to keeping, um, to keeping our sanity and, and to building up quality and, and, and caring for the kids and families and teachers in a way that's been so important through these challenging times. Hmm. I think for me that the, what I, and this has evolved again over time, what I cannot compromise on. And honestly, I've gotten a bit stubborn about it. I get irritated if somebody wants me to compromise on this is that I'm not willing to compromise on on a balance of care that um, that we have to care. It's not just caring about the kids, it's caring about the teachers and the teachers' families and the parents and the grandparents and how we are all interconnected like this. Um, in the beginning, you know, once we started seeing, okay, kids don't quite get it quite as, as difficult. I mean, there's still children who have died of COVID, but um, it's not in the same way as the, the older folks. Um, you know, sometimes people wanted to just focus on those kids. And I'm like, but that is absolutely wrong. When, because they're a vehicle for transmission and thinking about my teachers, I just kept really thinking of the visual of my, my infant teachers holding babies up close to their face. 
You know, I absolutely was going to have my teachers wear masks. It wasn't, this is not something for them to, to die for, right? We needed to take care of them. And now it has shifted, you know, in January with this latest variant that really looking at our wider field and what happens to our caregivers. No, it may not just be about life or death for them personally. I mean, that's always a possibility, but what happens when they get sick and they can't work for two weeks and then they pass it on to their child and now they've got to stay home with their child and they work at a center where they only make minimum wage and they don't, you know, get of a, a sick pay and all of that, you know, it has, we have to think of the whole big picture and I'm just not willing to compromise on that stubborn little me, but um, yeah, going forward, I'm thinking totally different about the whole big picture. God bless you. And you've been the voice of the field because so many, I think in the field of early childhood in particular and education more broadly have been feeling that how much in the places that are not taking this seriously, how much burnout there is, how much stress and how um, it's not that you and I, Corey, in our programs haven't faced hard times and haven't had people quit and wow. had difficult situations. Right? Yeah, we, have. we were both in hotbeds. You and I were both in hotbeds, right? Yes. New we York were. and Dallas. We were so. like, yes, um, we were both in hot spots and um, it's been rough I, it, inside the center as well, right? It's not that there aren't challenges, but somehow we've more often than not managed to keep up the joy and the optimism and, you know, people coming into the programs and feeling like it's a, it's a respite from the outside of the world. And again, not without the the rough edges and the challenges. And, and so some programs have managed to do that and something is emerging that's different. And so for me, it's in a couple of ways. It's um, these smaller programs that the pods have turned into micro schools, either for early childhood or for K to 12. It's the outdoor education movement where so many more educators moving outside. It's a focus on um, after the, the tragic murder of George Floyd and Black Lives Movement and how that in the midst of pandemic taught us called us to look inward about how we really are or aren't sufficiently inclusive and, and focus on anti-bias. All of those um, focus on wellness generally are emerging and in all programs, I think the large public programs as well, but even more in these smaller programs that in and of themselves, um, they're changing lives, I believe it, but not changing the world. But together, I believe we're changing the world and changing what education is. And that's been really powerful. And um, I feel I've, I mean, you know this, Corey, I, I've taught and led programs with students from birth through doctoral students in education, every age. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the greatness in early childhood is the best education has to offer. And we should be pulling that up instead of pulling the academics down. And, um, and I've become much more defiant. I know that lots of our, of our colleagues and respectfully want to be called early childhood educators. And we are educators. We are. Um, but I become a little more defiant in, in daycare and childcare and proudly putting care at the core. Yeah. And I think also just the other piece that is emerging is we've got to make this manageable. Mm -hmm. We have been just, I mean, pushing ourselves well before the pandemic, uh, trying to meet everybody's needs in these big ways. I mean, there's childcare centers for-profit child care centers that put haircutting studios in it. I mean, it's like just adding on more stuff. And it's not about these programs. It, that's not necessarily what's ne needed for the children. We got to make it manageable for the staff. We've got to make it a manageable life to be an early childhood educator, a child care provider. Um, and that is, is what is going to be good for the children as well as the adults. Yeah, absolutely. And so I wonder, I mean, we're still in it where we're not out of the woods yet. And yet we, we keep you and I both, 
your school is called um, Hope Day School. My book is called Haven of Havens of Hope. We still <laughs> go back to hope, and and we are we get grumpy sometimes, but we're hopeful at heart. <laughs> um, right? So, um, you know, what do we see for the future? And and I do see a lot of hope for the future. And I do see what I see at heart of of hopeful for the future is more possibilities and more options for how we can run over our programs, for what programs can look like, for what school can look like. And coming out of feeling um, this movement of standardization and standardized tests and, and things in the public system being about college and career readiness um, and not life readiness. And we can offer different options and, there's another quote from you that that I keep thinking about, Corey. Um, it's in the article, but it's everybody threw us under the bus. And I, I cracked up ah. I'm thinking about it, saying yeah. everybody threw us under the bus, but nobody really knows or some few really know what we're doing under the bus. We're redesigning the bus from the inside out and we're coming out a, in a whole new place. Yeah, you know, um... You know, one of the things I did during the pandemic, I, I really took inspiration from Waldorf and Waldorf philosophy, introducing some special festivals and things like that. But one of the things was incorporating bread making into our program. And we couldn't really do it in the classroom with kids, but the chef and I, Chef Ira and I learned how to bake bread. And there was something so spiritual about that I mean bread yeast and all that it's hard to like control it you don't know what's going to happen but we used it to nourish the children the children helped by grinding wheat to help make the flour we nourished the children we nourished the adults the teachers and we shared with family and it was such a piece that kind of brought us together when I look back on what I really want to take into the future is this lesson of we just all want to be good humans that is what it is all about on every level and every moment asking what am I doing right now in this moment whether it's working with a parent working with a teacher working with a child are we are we standing by being a good, good human Amen, Corey. Thank you so much. It has been such a gift getting to know you well, and I, I look forward to so many more conversations together. And I can't wait for people to read this book because it's a good one. I read a ton of books and, um, and it's not just because I'm in it. <laughs> it's a good one and I'm proud of you, Cher. It was a really great, great thing you did. Thank you so much. And if you are not in um, Early Education with Heart by Corey Berg in Facebook, you need to get into that Facebook group. Corey it still goes live. She has consistently through the pandemic every Friday morning. Now that could change. It's changed throughout. But right now it's every <laughs> Friday morning, depending on when you're listening to this. Um, and, and Corey speaks in this beautiful way that kind of captures what so many are feeling in the field. and delivers it um, with heart. It resonates and helps us understand ourselves. So thank you for being our voice, Corey, and looking forward to so many more conversations. All right. Take care, Shira. Take care all.